promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hello and welcome once again to another retro review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. We're going to be looking at Vengeance 2003 today and it took place on the 27th of July 2003 from the Pepsi Center in Denver, Colorado. It is the third annual edition of the Vengeance event and it is a Smackdown exclusive pay-per-view. Bad Blood was Raw exclusive, this is Smackdown exclusive. Uh, it is slightly lesser attended at 9,500 fans. And the main event was a triple threat between Brock Lesnar, Kurt Angle and The Big Show with the WWE Championship on the line. Uh, yeah, so it is available on the WWE Network. And the theme song was Price to Play by Stained. And it features in the game WWE 2K23 as a part of the John Cena storyline. And SmackDown vs. Raw. WWE SmackDown vs. Raw, of course. That is when the amalgamation of the SmackDown games and the Raw games on Xbox, respectively. And SmackDown on PlayStation joined forces because they decided they don't want to have two different studios making two different games. Why not just make one big game and put it on both consoles? Makes sense. They included the Nintendo Wii on this one as well, eventually, when that had come out. So, <clears throat> yeah, we've got uh, quite a card indeed for this one. So I'm quite looking forward to it. It is um, very close, of course, to the... Uh, UK pay-per-view, first time for a long time. Uh, we've had, I mean, there's been two successive ones, really. Clash of the Castle and and then this. But this is a big pay-per-view. It's not a special pay-per-view, it's a big one. So, it's not WrestleMania, but it's good. And and the uh, Money in the Bank ladder match uh, pay-per-view is uh, has just gone, basically. So, uh, we're doing this exactly 20 years from the event and we hope you enjoy my thoughts on this event we'll see what happens we start off with the introduction of a united states championship the reintroduction. Obviously, it was decommissioned at the purchase of WCW. Stephanie McMahon now believes that there should be, and rightly so, a mid-card championship. And so she set up a tournament which culminated at Vengeance 2003. But before we get into that match, there was... Also, a pre-show match featuring the uh, so Ultimate Dragon and Chris Canyon. Who's better than Canyon? Well, everybody. Uh, sad story, Chris Canyon. Uh, he, yeah, he's no longer with us. Ultimo Dragon, failed experiment, in my opinion. But um, doesn't take away from his legacy. He was... Really, really good. And so was Chris Canyon as well. Um, but yeah, sadly, no longer with us. But Ultimo Dragon did defeat Chris Canyon in the pre-show. On to the United States Championship match. It is for a brand new minted title. It's not the original US Championship, which would have been quite easy to replicate. It is a redesign, and actually, I really like this championship. I quite like the US Championship in general anyway, even the spinner belt. Um, and I love the new one. I've got to say, I do love the new one. I wish they'd take um, owners from that championship when creating new championships, because that championship is beautiful, uh, along with the decommissioned UK championship, which still irks me. 
But anyway, <clears throat> we're on to the match. This match is a genuine five star classic as an opener. These two go at each other like nobody's business. And I'm talking about, again, two people who are no longer with us, one who is celebrated and one who has been committed to the bin of history in terms of wrestling. That is Eddie Guerrero, Latino Heat, very celebrated. And of course, Chris Benoit, who is not celebrated based on what he did outside of the ring, not inside the ring. And I will always say this, Chris Benoit was really good in a wrestling ring as a wrestler. What he did outside was deplorable and again I agree with WWE on this should not be celebrated in any way whatsoever especially with people calling for him to go into the Hall of Fame why celebrate that uh, as a wrestler yes as a person uh, for what he did no definitely not uh, and that is my stance on that and I'm pretty sure I've told you that a couple of times but this match let's take nothing away from these two they are absolutely fantastic and there's a reason that they came over from WCW before the purchase because <clears throat> they are that good. Slow start to this one. As you'd expect, build up, um, lots of rest holds, lots of lock ups, Eddie Guerrero going through the ropes to stop Chris Benoit getting at him uh, and eventually when things do calm down and they're both in the ring um, and there's some moves going off, we still get lots of technical grapple wrestling. It's not fast, it's not quick, considering these two are known for high-flying moves and known for being quick, the start is really slow and it builds up to a lovely crescendo at the end. Now, there's suicide dives, there's <clears throat> uh, multiple attempts on the cross face. Uh, Eddie Guerrero is definitely on the back foot throughout most of this match. Right up until the point where Mike Kyoda, the referee assigned to this match, gets taken out once. Um, at this point, Eddie Guerrero gets the championship, hits Chris Benoit plants it on Chris Benoit and plays like he's been hit, uh, hoping the referee will call it out and, and and see Chris Benoit with the championship. It's like, hold on, I've been hit by the championship because the referee was hit by the championship as well during this whole melee. And, um, yeah, it, it's a case of... Uh, not working first time so uh, Chris Benoit goes up goes for the headbutt but it's a falling headbutt rather than a diving headbutt Eddie Guerrero pulls Mike Keogh poor Mike Keogh in this match let's give the guy some credit he takes an absolute beating <laughs> throughout this match and he uh, hits Mike Keogh with the headbutt so Mike Keogh is out again uh, at this point it is also at this point, Eddie Guerrero's like, you know what, sod this. I'm going to go and get the championship again. I'm going to hit Chris Benoit around the head with it. Um, and that's all in that melee. All this time, Chris Benoit is down. Eddie Guerrero has the championship. He's planning what's going to go next because the referee's out. Enter Rhino. Great play-by-play -play commentary here because they big up the fact that Rhino is Chris Benoit's running buddy. Well, what he does is run right through him with a gore. Eddie Guerrero looks shocked. He gets ready to take the move and it doesn't happen. Rhino celebrating in the middle of the ring like, I did that, that's cool. Eddie Guerrero shrugs, chucks the championship to one side, goes up top, hits the frog splash, beautiful frog splash, manages to get the referee, Mike Kyoda, to come round. One, two, three, the match is finished. Bonafide, five-star classic, 
first match. I'm going to give this five cheap shots out of five because even the running made sense. Um, perfect, in my view. Absolutely perfect. Mr. Perfect couldn't have done a more perfect match than this. Five cheap shots out of five. Phenomenal. If you are learning to be a wrestler, watch this. This is good. It's good storytelling. It's good wrestling. It's thoroughly entertaining. Moving on now, and what would a SmackDown pay-per-view be without the annual McMahon storyline? And this time it is Vince McMahon sitting in the office, smelling the roses, as he calls in his daughter Stephanie, with his wife, Stephanie's mother, having been attacked on Raw by Kane. <clears throat> Both of these McMahons have matches on the show tonight and Stephanie alludes to this but gets really annoyed when Vince says your mother's condition and because when he cuts these promo on Monday Night Raw he says he hopes that Stephanie ends up like Linda and is vegetated. Absolutely disgusting, but as you would expect from 2003, very, very Vince. We move on now to the next match, and it does feature Jamie Noble going against Billy Gunn. A match that's completely out there because I didn't expect this. However, the mismatch in size and strength and everything else like that was there to see but there is a storyline here because Jamie Noble wants to sleep with Tori a playboy cover girl and it's no secret that Nydia and Jamie Noble are an item in kayfabe and with the stipulation being that if Billy Gunn loses Tori has to sleep with Jamie Noble on Smackdown of course because it has to be live um that, uh, yeah, you'd expect that Billy Gunn would win. That's why Tory picked Billy Gunn, because the size difference. But Jamie Noble is not one to back down from a fight, and he has put on quite the show for the cruiserweight division throughout the whole of his tenure. And here, he really does pick up the fight with Billy Gunn taking down the big man from the knees. And works on that knee. And that is the story of the match. Right up until the end. Where Billy Gunn misses going for Jamie Noble. Almost crashes into Tory Wilson. And then Jamie Noble gets the roll up. Grabs the tights and gets the win. He celebrates. Nydia storms off. People are actually cheering Jamie Noble here because they're like, yeah, good for you, pal. You're going to sleep with a Playboy cover girl on live TV. <laughs> Yay. WWE 2003, everybody. I know I use that line every single time I do a podcast. However, I can't describe it any other way. <laughs> it's just as it is. It is just that. WWE 2003. We move on to the next match. So we're moving onwards now and we go into the back for a segment with the APA, the Acolytes Protection Agency, who are gearing up for their APA Invitational. Uh, they are being interviewed by SmackDown's number one announcer, Funaki, who gets handed an invitation to the barroom brawl, and that is our next match. Um, I know I can't call it a match, it's not a match, but basically, a load of people, including the Easter Bunny and Brother Love, yes, I'm not making this up, this is what happened during this pay per view, uh, go into this set, this movie set that's made up like a a bar, and I remember this vividly because 
I remember watching this and absolutely loving it. And I can't say my opinions changed because it is absolutely the most fun I've had for a, a while watching a wrestling show. And um, they never did it again, which is really sad. But, you know, uh, Bradshaw would go on to be JBL, etc, etc. So, <clears throat> yeah, it is, like I say, it's an invitational. Brother Love here does some really good stuff. He cuts, the uh, APA cuts promos, like there's no rules. Uh, last person standing wins the match. Uh, although, last person drinking, rather, wins the match. Brother Love snatches the microphones. I love you. And uh, even though I love you, doesn't mean I like you. And yeah, all that kind of stuff. Brother Love, considering he was never an active in-ring competitor, uh, as that character at the very least, he puts on a show here. He gets the first blow in with a, with a stool, a bar stool. Uh, and takes out two random mashed wrestlers who you never see again. Um, and they hit the floor. Basically, you hit the floor, you're out. So, yeah, but he gets the first blow in. He does a really good job. Sean O'Hare gets some stuff in here. He's doing his martial arts kicks. Uh, Spanky is dancing on the bar. Um, Shannon Moore jumps off the stage into the bar. There's people going through tables. People going through windows. It's just insane. But it's so much fun. Brother Love throws someone into a mirror. <laughs> and uh, yeah, all this time, all this time, what is the story of this match? Funaki never leaves his bar chair, but eventually drinks himself into oblivion and falls off backwards. Uh, absolutely beautiful, uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant segment. I'm not going to call it a match, but it trumps the uh, redneck triathlon from the month previous at Bad Blood, definitely. And this therein lies my opinion on this time frame. Smackdown was hands down the best show. Raw was the flagship show, always was, it always will be. But SmackDown was incredible. And the thought, you know, even the matches where they had dual pay-per-views, they had better matches. But this one, I can't give a rating to, but it's well worth going back and having a laugh at because it is so much fun. And it's just, if you're a wrestling fan, this is one of those things. It's like a, a segue uh, in Family Guy where you just say, oh, do you remember that time? And then it just cuts away to doing something different. Uh, we've already had a, an opening match that was absolutely incredible. And now you get this. Um, and it's just going to go better and better. We've got a triple threat match for the end for the end of the show as well. So... You know, this is just, it's amazing. Um, and then we go into the back where uh, Jamie Noble is licking his copy of the uh, uh, Playboy. It looks like it's well used. He's been carrying it around in his love case. Uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it looks, as Taz says, it looks like a well used copy. Of Playboy magazine, but we'll see what happens with that one. <laughs> oh, gosh. One thing I could always count on wrestling doing is taking me away from life and just having a good time with it. It's so much fun. We move on to the next match. So we move on and we've got another championship match now because... We're going towards the Tag Team Championships. It is the world's greatest tag team defending against Rey Mysterio, the current Cruiserweight Champion, and Billy Kidman. So out of commission is the Cruiserweight Championship with another Cruiserweight in that division tied up with Billy Gunn. 
in that storyline with Tory Wilson, Wilson and most of the others in the bar fight. Anyway, regardless of that, this match, again, is fire. It's really good. It is incredible, as you can expect from uh, these four competitors. The world's greatest tag team, Shelton Benjamin, Charlie Haas, been put on a pedestal. Um, and quite rightly so, because they are really good. Um, at team Angle, as they would be called. And uh, Mysterio always good for the good for the money back in two thousand two, and Billy Kidman is just nuts anyway. So yeah, there's not much pause for breath in this match, but it is incredible. There is some questionable tactics from Billy Kidman and Rey Mysterio, and I thought they were quite heelish, which is why I'm going to knock it down a little bit, but. The rest of it was just nuts. There was a shooting star press from the top rope to the outside. There was dragon whips and assisted sent-ons and assisted hurricane runners and all sorts of things going off in this match. And it was just, it was a masterclass in tag team wrestling for the lighter divisions so yeah this match would finish with a uh, a blind tag and uh, with Michael Cole insisting before he saw the replay, replay um, that the world's greatest tag team had cheated but it was a blind tag and um, Shelton Benjamin would come down on to Rey Mysterio as he was sat on Charlie Haas's shoulders. Bit of a doomsday device, but he'd follow it through and and, and land with that and uh, get the pin. Uh, great match. Four and a half cheap shots out of five. I'd say damn near perfect. Just some questionable tactics, which made me question whether uh, Billy Kidman and Rey Mysterio were face or heel with the knee to the back and the assisted, uh, you know, distracting referee, assisted Hurricane Runner in the corner. And, uh, yeah, so apart from that, really good, really good match. And Charlie Haas, Shelton Benjamin, oh, I think, gosh, they could have gone to the moon and back. But, um, you know, not been used properly. Charlie Haas obviously left wrestling quite early. Shelton Benjamin's still there, but he's again he's not being used properly. Um, so yeah, it is what it is, and that is wrestling. Good match. So we move on to the next match, and we call it a match very loosely because it is a no disqualification cat fight, and the most entertaining part of this match was the promo package as we see Stephen McMahon chasing um, chasing Sable into a limo, pulling off her top. <laughs> yes, all this all this happens on pay-per-view. Um and and basically setting up this grudge match because Sable is is the mistress of Mr. McMahon. Um yeah I, you know what? For what it was Actually, for two non-active competitors to put on something that is slightly entertaining was really good. And I think part of that was the fact that it was no disqualification, even though the referee took away the chair that Steph McMahon was going to hit its table with. Um, there's... <clears throat> Fighting on the outside, which, you know, it there's face rubbing on the mat. They do what they need to do to get across that this is just a scrap. And this is everything that you'd expect from um, a bar fight uh, in normal terms. And I've been a bouncer and... Yeah, this is pretty much what you get. <laughs> um, duh, the women can go, I can tell you that. I won't step in between them. But, <clears throat> yeah, it comes down to 
um, Sable getting her top pulled down as she's trying to get away. She gets thrown back into the ring. Uh, the referee pushes Stephanie Man out of the way, says, you know, let her pull her top up. Uh, Stephanie pushes the referee out of the way and says, I'm going to, you know, finish this off. Gets kicked to the gut. And as the referee is taking his shirt off so that Sable can cover up, A-Train comes down to the ring, gives Steph McMahon a, I think it's called a derailer, uh, like a, a, a running sort of splash without it being in the corner. And uh, yeah, that's it. Sable miraculously recovers with the shirt of the referee over her um, puppies, or we'll just call them puppies, and uh, gets the pin. Um, not quite sure how to score this. I was mildly entertained by this, and it wasn't because the shirt came down or anything like that. It was a scrap, and sometimes that's what you need. Now, you have two of these on one show and it can be watered down like the bar fight that was fun this one it serves a purpose as we go through the year and we'll see that as we go through the shows but i'm going to give this one a reasonable score of two cheap shots out of five because i'm just yeah, I, I, it was entertaining for what it was. And we go on to the next match, which is an incredible match, actually. A young John Cena going against a veteran in The Dead Man, The Undertaker. Now... The promo package for this, the build-up was really, really good. You know, John Cena disrespecting The Undertaker. He said, you know, we used to have that. You dropped me like a bad habit. And now I'm going to take what you've worked for. And and basically what he says, it, the part of the promo was to piss on his grave. And uh, there is a part of that where he's actually in a graveyard doing said act. So, yeah. It's um, full on this one. It's a good, good setup for this because that gets the Undertaker's attention. It does, as I mentioned earlier, appear in the uh, um, game, the 2K23 game as part of the John Cena thing. And yeah, like I say, it's a really good match. John Cena does not look out of place at all in this match. Undertaker takes over early. John Cena makes his comeback, makes him look decent in adversity. And he um, does every, everything he possibly can to get on top, including throwing the Undertaker into the barricade um, which The Undertaker did to him earlier on in the match because he couldn't physically pick up the dead man. And we all know John Cena's uh, a strong chap, so he, he could do, but Undertaker telling a story here, being dead weight, throws him into the barrier, gives him a good kick in the stomach as well because he can't get him into the ring to beat the ten count and uh, John Cena then starts beating down on an injured Undertaker blood coming from the mouth here as the Undertaker tries to gain some control from this point John Cena is well on top getting a couple of near falls and um, the Undertaker still kicking out John Cena here showing that he is um, new to the game, shall we say. A uh, bit cocky, young cocky. Um, and goes up for a, you know, go, goes to the second rope, 
shows out to the crowd. Undertaker nips in, grabs him in the the uh, power one position, gives him a last ride, and the Undertaker gets the pin. I really enjoyed this match. I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm quite a big fan of John Cena, and I always have been. There was that point in time where he just won everything, which you know, it did get on my wick. But as far as it goes, I think John Cena surpassed that and he's now gone into veteran territory. Um, and he can still pull a crowd. Let's face it, he can. He comes back every so often, has a, has a little bit to do, has a match sometimes as well, and uh, still pulls in the crowds, which makes him a veteran in my eyes and um, probably one of the biggest superstars to ever come out of the WWE. This match showcases that brilliantly. When he went into the Super Cena mode, it was completely different to what he what he can do um, and what he did in his earlier career, which was create a character which was cocky, brash, harsh, you name it, it was good and it was entertaining. And that is the E in WWE. So I'm going to give this match, it's not quite as good as that first match. I'm going to give it four and a half cheap shots out of five. Absolutely serviceable match, which entertained all the way through. It told that story, the young, hungry superstar coming to get the big dog, coming to take over the yard and the big dog not wanting to give that yard up just yet. Great match. Well, it's time to move on to the next match now. And it is the literal definition of a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest as Zach Gowin goes up against the owner of the WWE, Mr. Vincent Kennedy McMahon, in a one-on-one -on -one contest for the ages. Because this was the coming of age for Zach Gowan. Having beaten the big show along with Stephanie McMahon with the help of Kurt Angle and with the help of Brock Lesnar, Zach Gowan had earned himself a WWE contract. And thus, the match was set. Zach Gowan versus Vince McMahon. Now, Zach Gowan, like I say, he's got one leg. But he is really good. Really good. And Vince just knows how things work. So he really, really put over Zach Gowan here. And it was a strong, strong performance. And he put him over well, even though Zach Gowan unfortunately did come short in terms of the win. But yeah, it was a fight and there was a lot of these on this card um, really enjoyed this match Zach Gowan with the quickness even though he only had he only has one leg and in fact he took his prosthetic leg off before they even started the match he only uses it to walk down to the ring um, there's uh, acai moonsaults from Zach Gowan um basement drop kicks, all sorts of things. And he's not one to be grounded because he's he's very aerial wrestler. He was quite small in stature as well. So he uses everything in his arsenal. Even to the point where Vince gets a chair, the referee takes it off him. Vince pulls him, pushes him away. Uh Falls down onto one knee because Zach Gowan has taken out one of Vince McMahon's legs. And as he falls down, Zach Gowan kicks that chair into Vince's face. And it is a genuine cut. Um, there's no way he uh, he bladed there. And it was pouring. Um, but this is what I mean. Like For this match, to do that. I'm guessing that wasn't part of it. So it added to the drama. It 
it got to that crescendo. Zach Gowan goes up for the moonsault, his patented moonsault, beautiful moonsault it is as well. He twists in midair, like a twisting sent on type thing. Vince rolls inwards. Zach Gowan hits hard and Vince crawls into the pin. And uh, Zach Gowan eats a clean pin here with Vince McMahon. Now, Vince is quite active on the roster in the year 2003. So, yeah, he he's looking good here. And although uh, Zach Gowan lost, like I say, put him over well. So there was something that Vince saw in Zach Gowan that, um, you know, had a lot of potential. And um, all credit to him. Because this match, to both of them actually, I'll give them that, to both of them, it was a clash of styles with Vince being the more powerful and Zach being the quicker of the two. But ultimately a very entertaining match and I'm going to give this one four cheap shots out of five. Um, br- brilliant, absolutely brutal match, really entertaining. Like I say, the blood was accidental in my opinion so and you know it's pay-per-view so I don't I don't mind that so much it was nasty though it was it was pouring so yeah uh not for the faint of heart as it were but yeah great match we move on to the into the back now with Eddie Guerrero and um Josh Matthews asking Eddie if his victory over Chris Benoit was tainted because of the actions of Rhino. He just says, look at me, I'm the US champion. The reason I'm the US champion is because I don't have friends. And I'm wearing the gold and it's going to stay with me for a very long time. He goes to celebrate and he goes, "Essa," a lot, and then walks off. So we then get the promo package for the Last match, the triple threat match for the WWE Championship between Brock Lesnar, who is the current reigning defending undisputed champion, or the WWE champion, as it is at this point in time. And he is going against the former champion, Kurt Angle, the man who he beat at WrestleMania 19. And... The Big Show, a man who is no stranger to the title either. So we move on now to the triple threat match. And it is the reigning defending WWE champion Brock Lesnar going against Kurt Angle, the man who Brock Lesnar beat at WrestleMania 19 for the championship. And the third participant in this match is The Big Show, who is no stranger to the big gold WWE belt as well, the Undisputed Championship, as I will always call it. The original Undisputed Championship. Or well, the original of the modern era, anyway. Um, we get a nice promo package. Um, they always do these really, really well. And uh, in 2003, we don't get many of them now, but this one is done really well. Lots and lots of build-up to this one. Like, say, the Kurt Angle being out, the comeback story, Brock Lesnar calling him up asking how he is because she feels like uh, he caused that issue and um, Big Show just being there as the heel uh, and the mammoth heel at this point in time. The the heel, the Big Show that we all know he should have been all the way through his run. So yeah, the Big Show we know he should have been all the way through his run and they really put that over here. And this is another epic match. It's very worth a watch and how to do a, a triple threat match. Usually the big guys in there to be taken out nice and early for the other two to fight. And it was no different here, except the big show does have a massive role to play in this triple threat match. And they do it really well. Not only does he get angle slammed through a table, he also comes back and 
hits a double choke slam on both Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle um, in the ring to make him look really strong. During the course of the match, there is more cuts and more uh, bleeding from Brock, Brock Lesnar and from Kurt Angle. You can tell this one was a fight from start to finish. And because it's triple threat, there are no rules. Champion's advantage does not count in a triple threat match. So it's the first person to pick up the pin, no matter who they pin, as the winner. And um, they booked this match really, really well. Like I say, Kurt Angle's comeback story, Brock Lesnar being the friend at this point rather than the enemy, and Big Show being the the third person to help carry both of those guys through the match and make them look good. Uh, one in defeat and one in victory because it would be Kurt Angle who would pick up the championship again and even though I've seen this this pay per view many times, I was still surprised by the outcome. The uh, Big Show hits the double choke slam that I mentioned earlier, goes for the pin on Brock Lesnar. He kicks out, goes for the pin on Kurt Angle, nearly gets there. Brock Lesnar stops the count, and as he goes for the second. Choke slam. Kurt Angle manages to get up, hit an angle slam on the Big Show, almost on top of Brock Lesnar, uh, and Brock then goes for Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle gets whipped into the corner. Brock Lesnar goes charging in, misses. Kurt Angle gets the angle lock on Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar manages to kick out of that, but in the aftermath, the Big Show gets back up. He gets another angle slam and another angle slam to Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle gets a clean victory over the former champion Brock Lesnar. What a match. Another five star match. So without further ado I'm giving this one five cheap shots out of five because it is brilliant. Absolutely loved this match from start to finish and all three competitors in this match were used really well and they came out smelling of roses even though two of them had to lose and that is the mark of a good triple threat match if you want to know how triple threat match is done this is got to be one of the ones that you should watch to get that idea of that but wow, I think this might actually be, apart from WrestleMania 19, uh, well, the WrestleMania is just in general, really, uh, 17, 18 and 19, this might actually be the best pay-per-view I've seen in the three years that I've been doing the, uh, the, the pay-per-views. In fact, it's four years now, because I think I started them in 2020 during lockdown. And um, I've been doing them monthly since and stopped doing the actual shows that are on live now. But this is how to do a pay-per-view. This was why Smackdown was so much better than Raw at this point in time. And this was why the WWE was a juggernaut. Because they had so much talent. They could put on a bar fight at ringside and it would still be good because of the talent involved in it. They could have a uh, sleep with a Playboy cover girl match and it will still be entertaining as hell. Um, a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest, still really entertaining, but the shining light have come as bookends at either end of the pay-per-view. The first match, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, beautiful wonderful match and the last match the triple threat match absolutely fantastic the bar fight really fun uh jamie noble versus uh billy gunn probably yeah i mean actually that was that was good even even the stephanie mcmahon versus sable cat fight was was 
entertaining as all hell. So, and the tag team match, of course, which was absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, you've got a complete pay-per-view here and it's absolutely the best that I've seen. And I will go far, go as far as to say it may actually be better as a whole show than the WrestleManias. Um, but it's a close one. It's a very, very close one. Um, yeah. And they've already started advertising WrestleMania 20 as well, so... Wow, what a show. And we come to the conclusion of this podcast as uh, we do that. Because we are now going to move into August. Obviously, we're coming up to SummerSlam. And yeah, it's going to be another good one. So... Look forward to that one. I'll get that out on the day that it happens, um, which I haven't checked beforehand, which I should do all the time, but I don't. So, yeah, if you enjoyed the podcast, please do consider subscribing and uh, checking us out for all of your old school or retro wrestling reviews. Um, we move on to SummerSlam, which is on August the 24th. Uh, obviously a dual branded pay-per-view. Uh, the uh, And the... Um, of course, yeah, we get the second ever Elimination Chamber at uh, SummerSlam 2003. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm looking forward to watching that. So hope you've enjoyed this. Hope you've enjoyed watching it on YouTube or watching it or listening to it as a podcast, of course, as well. And uh, definitely thinking about getting my mug back on the, on the screen. But it's just so much easier to do it like this with a busy schedule of wrestling training and things like that so again thank you very much for listening to my ramblings for retro wrestling reviews on cheap shot entertainment i've been your host luke you are the cheap not sheep sheep not the cheap not quite what we blah blah the cheap shot nation i will get it out there eventually <laughs> uh, you are the cheap shot nation and I will see you next time. Goodbye. Hiya.